why is it that under this government, it's always the middle class and working Canadians who pay a little bit more. Meanwhile, wealthy friends like Stephen Bronfman always end up getting away paying less. Mr. Speaker, as you well know, we are fully committed to fighting tax evasion and tax avoidance. So in the name of the top Liberal fundraiser, Stephen Bronfman, who is heir to the multi-billion dollar whiskey fortune, appeared in the so-called Paradise Papers, millions of documents that pull back the curtain on individuals and corporations that use tax havens. Well, the opposition pounced. Were high-powered people in the Liberal government doing something illegal? Were they tax dodging? Mr. Bronfman has denied any wrongdoing. It's an explanation the Prime Minister supports, and there's nothing illegal about tax havens. But tax havens have an estimated $250 billion, Canadian dollars, sloshing around in them. Has the government done enough to investigate them? To find out, we're joined now by the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, Carla Qualtro. Minister, great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start with that big number. Your government has been in a lot of controversy trying to close loopholes, your government's term, on doctors, small businesses, and uh, that would collect $250 million in revenue. There's $250 billion in tax havens. Are you, is your government doing enough to close those? Absolutely. I think we're doing a lot in a bunch of different fronts. So CRA attacks this issue in two ways. First of all, they proactively try and identify people who are avoiding taxes, who are evading taxes. And then secondly, they you know, reactively take the opportunity provided by things like the Paradise Papers to investigate what people are doing. But how much are you actually doing on this? In 2013, there was the Panama Papers. Right. So far, as what I can tell, and you have senators like Percy Down who said, you keep saying we put a billion dollars, you've only spent about 35 or 40 million on it. In other words, until this happened, you basically did nothing. Yeah, well, I think the numbers bear, tell a little different story, to be fair. I think if you look at the numbers of the Conservatives, in 2014, they closed 98 audits on uh, international tax evasion files. We closed 223 in 2016. I mean, we've definitely beefed up um, the capacity of CRA, not maybe as quickly as some would like, but we are committed to international tax evasion. Okay, a lot of people just say, why the heck do we have tax havens anyway? Because I, I know there's treaties, yep. but there's, a lot, there's not a lot of transparency. There's not a lot of regulation. Why does Canada tolerate this if there's $250 billion sloshing around them? Why don't we stop them? Well, that's a really good question, and I think that's one that we need to probably en embark upon. There needs to be a good public discussion on what we can do, because we are pursuing a lot of uh, entities and people, and maybe the, maybe the challenge lies in changing our policy. Are you actively looking at closing tax havens as, a, as an idea? Would Canada do that? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I apologize, and the Minister of Revenue probably does. But, you know, as far as I see it, the, the, the more we can have better public policy discourse, the better. Okay, let me just go to the Stephen Bronfman. He says he's done nothing wrong. And again, there's nothing yep. illegal in these tax havens. But he, he put out a report saying, you know, I've done nothing wrong. There's been big reports in, in media about the company he owns. The Prime Minister accepted his explanation before there was a proper investigation. Why would he accept an explanation? before there's been an actual investigation. Well, I think the Prime Minister publicly reacted to what Mr. Mr. Bronfman said. And I can tell you, like, I have no reason to doubt what he said yet. We don't know yet. And it's up to the CRA now to pursue, as they're doing, um, any lead that the Paradise Paper, you know, gets them. All right, uh, I gotta talk about Phoenix. You uh, sure do. Boy, you got tax havens <laughs> in your file, you've not, well, and, yeah. and so, but now you got Phoenix. The yep. Phoenix pay system, for folks that may not know this, is of course the government pay system. It was instituted originally by conservatives, but it was started by the liberals. You guys decided to start it. And it was supposed to save us 50 to $70 million. It's costing us $400 million. How long is this fiasco gonna go for? You know, that's a good question. Right now our focus really is on paying people. And I just, I just feel horribly that we're not able to pay our public servants you know, promptly and accurately every two weeks, and it keeps me awake at night, to tell you the truth. The challenge here, Evan, is this was a massive business transformation program, you know, process that the Conservatives looked at as a cost-cutting measure. So they didn't put in place the business processes. They didn't look at this in terms of integrating with the HR system. Like, there's so many things that we're having to directly deal that, with. If yep. they didn't do that, why didn't you delay the implementation? If you, your government decided we're going to start it, yep. You could have said, these aren't in place, let's not do it, because people are going to get burned. They did get burned. What's your accountability, your government's accountability, for starting it when you knew this it wasn't ready? Well, our job is to fix it. Our job is to definitely stabilize the pay system. I can tell you, you know, at that moment when it was go or no go, there was really no choice. The choice wasn't between 
the new system and an old system. The choice was between the new system and no system. We didn't have pay compensation advisors. They had all been fired. We, they had the Conservatives had decommissioned the you old no system. No choice but to implement a at system. At that point, the choice had been made. We had to keep going. We had to pay people. We could. There was nothing to, to fall back on. At you that know, time. the opposition will say, in the famous line from yeah. Robert, you had an option, and your option was not to implement a system that was going to end up stiffing government workers. Well, I'll give you that perhaps we didn't know the magnitude or the scope of the, the challenge in front of us. We certainly didn't knowingly implement a system that was going to yield this kind of problem. But but I can assure you that the choice for my former my predecessor was not mm -hmm. a functioning former system that was maybe a little antiquated or a new system that had bugs. It was the new system. Okay. What is actually wrong with the system? Well, the system, well, again, it's a whole process, right? So the, the software itself had to be customized to meet 80,000 different business rules created by all the different collective agreements that we have in the government of Canada. We didn't properly, or one didn't properly, you know, integrate the HR systems with the, the pay system. We're working all that out. We're working all that through. We're training people. We are hiring more compensation advisors. We're doing all the, th but it's just but taking too long. I know. It. You're, you're saying that. Imagine the workers. Yeah. Because it was a year ago that it was supposed to be last Halloween. Now we just had another yeah. Halloween. How much longer until this is fixed? Do you have a date? We don't have a date, uh, but I can tell you right now we're in the process of implementing the 19 collective agreements that our government has negotiated with public servants. You know, the Conservatives let 27 collective agreements lapse in their time, and we committed to negotiating them. We've negotiated 19 or 20 of them, but that adds hundreds of thousands of transactions to Phoenix, right? So the numbers have been going up. They're going to go down in January or February. Okay, they're going to go down, yep. but it won't be fixed. Just real quick, so no date on that. Nope. You know, the, the Senate says we're dumping it. We're getting rid of it. How come they can get rid of it and no one else can? Well, the Senate makes their choices, and we, you know, we have some organizations that we, we, we've centralized for 42 government departments and our agencies. Other departments and agencies use it, but they have their own compensation advisors. The Senate opted out. Okay, but some may wonder if they can do it, why shouldn't others? How much will the government, you're supposed to save money, how much will taxpayers lose on this darn thing? You know, I, again, I'm hesitant to put a number on that because we still have million, to keep... 500 million? We're probably there. Million? Yep, I'd say right now. 600? Gosh. Don't hold me to a number, Evan. I'm really hesitant to say that we, we've currently invested the $309 million the Conservatives spent. We put in $143 million this past fall. We've reinvested the $70 million that the Conservatives booked to kind of be the savings piece for two. Right. So that's where we are now. Could it hit a billion? I hope not, but I can't guarantee. You can't guarantee nope. that we won't? A billion dollars for a system that was supposed to save us $50 million, you can't guarantee we won't hit, lose a billion on fixing this thing? I can't guarantee that, no. Let's talk about procurement. Jets. Yes. It's, another, yes. it's another file. <laughs> yes. Your government said we're going to buy new jets. Then you said we have to have an interim jets, 18 yep. new fighter jets because until we have an open competition. Yep. So you're going to buy, originally it was from Boeing, that's off the table now. Will you still, does your government still committed to buying 18 interim fighter jets. Yes. So right now we're still looking at ways to, you know, on a on an interim basis, replenish our fleet until the full fleet replacement is in place. So we're going to do a fair, open, uh, transparent process for the full fleet replacement. And we're right now haven't landed on an option to be fair for the 18, but that's going to happen. Why? Why now? Now you're two years into the mandate. Yeah. Why don't you just have a fair, open competition? Why have the, the old fleet the 18 interim, which is going to be five to seven billion dollars, and then a new fleet. Why not just have the fair competition? You're two years in, you've kind of missed that interstep. Well, Why not just go for it? I'm not sure we've missed it. I think that the idea that you know there's this capability gap that we have we've identified that our defense policy has again identified and committed to filling. We got to make sure we get our people these jets as soon as we possibly can, and but we do can't we have wait. A gap? But if we have a gap, do we need 18 jets? Like, are you going to buy them? Are, is your government looking at used jets from Australia, like we've heard? Is that an option? That's one of the options. Yep. So. And is the F-35 jet, are you open to procuring the F-35 in a fair open competition? 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah, and I mean, when the idea can that competition this, start? Well, ideally, the competition will be launched early 2019, but before that, a whole bunch of other after procedural. The, after the next election? No, no, no. But w before the election, early okay. 2019. Early 2019. Yeah, early, in, in okay, the so there'll be so, that was our commitment. So and we're before stick to that, that, you'll procure 18 fighter jets yep. in term, and you'll start the. Yes, and we will launch the process for the full fleet replacements, which will the RFP will come out in early 2019. That's still the target, and we're in line. We're definitely on track to do that. Got a lot of files, Minister. I appreciate <laughs> it. That's a lot of juggling. <laughs> you got a lot of juggling. I appreciate you joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you.